to where Death Holler brought us. Season 3, Slash or Pass. It became the classic horror film podcast of its time. And now Death Holler brings us the most shocking season what? ever. Dang the pops. Season 4, Dead or Dead. Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Imagine, if you will, that one of the hosts is absolutely terrified of zombies. So, what's the plan? Bash him in the head, that seems to work out. Now, accept the fact there is no escaping this horror. Death Holler brings back the dead. Remember, when you're in Death Holler, listener discretion is advised. With hospitality like this, you'll never want to leave. We hope you stay alive. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk. Welcome back to Death Holler. I'm your host, Reverend Dr. Death, and joining me as always is my co-host and the spirit who promised her husband, I'll swallow your soul during the wedding vows, La Urena. How'd that wedding night go, Urena? Was Noah dead by dawn? Um, I'm sure he wished he was. I think he thought I meant something else, um, but I really <laughs> meant that I was, you know, going to swallow his soul, his actual soul. Um, I told him I wanted not just his body, but his soul. He didn't believe me. <laughs> it's his fault. Uh, this podcast was uh, meant to come out a lot sooner than this, but uh, uh, La Urena visited Universal <laughs> and ended up uh, becoming one of the uh, Evil Dead for a bit, so Whew. she couldn't podcast, but oh my she's God. better now. Kind of, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I sound nearly as congested. I think I sound better, but I am still, like, recovering, not just from – I really feel like I had a um, – some sort of COVID, but I never tested positive, which I have not, I've had, I've probably had COVID many times, but every time I get tested for it, it comes out negative. And I still to this day wonder if back in 2020, when I had that antibody infusion, if that has something to do with it. But then again, my kids never had the infusion. Nona never did. And she always, she's not once in her life tested positive for COVID. Those tests are really weird. Like you, I mean, I, there was a, I, I remember back during 2020, whenever they were making us test people, uh, as part of what we did in the store and they walk and there was a whole family walked in and, and there was every one of them was positive except for one member. And that one member had been with the rest of the people and never, and never caught it. Like it just randomly missed them. Like they've yeah. been in close proximity and it just, that, I mean, that, and they didn't even register for the antibodies or anything. Well, so. yeah, my kids registered for <laughs> antibodies. Um, we did confirm that. So they've had it at least once. But every time we've tried to test them, and we're talking multiple tests. We're just we're talking about the at-home 15-minute and the send into the laboratory test or whatever they do, if they did that. I'm not 100. All I know is it took a while to get results. And, um, yeah, they've they've not tested positive in person. We just had to find out after the fact. Um, I think Nona and I got something like that because I had just major fatigue that I feel like I'm still recovering from and just major congestion overall. So nothing too crazy. I'm, 
It just sounds like universal crud to me. It's but. the universal crud. That, and I told you that I was like, you know, is it just like I wasn't licking the handrails this time. So I don't know. <laughs> My dad was so strict. It was so funny. My dad, he's, I'm 40 some years old and my dad does not want to let me or my kids out of his sight, which is hilarious. Cause we let the kids run off sometimes like me and my husband do, you know, we're like, Hey, go have fun. We'll meet at the Simpsons, you know? But my dad, like I touched the handrail one time. My dad's like, don't fucking touch that. And I was like, Oh shit. Like, so we didn't touch the handrails, but think about it. You have to pull the right things down. You have to pull them to towards you. You hold on to the right handles. Like, who cares yeah, about they, the handrails? And they definitely don't have the time to wipe them down. Mm-mm. Even during COVID, because I went down to, like, uh, Disney during, like, 2020 when COVID was, you know, at its peak. Yeah. They w- they wasn't doing that. I mean, it was, uh, you know, they had hand sanitizer, yeah. so you could feel better about it, but that was about all they did. Yeah, I'm, like... I'm like five for five of getting sick every time I go to Universal. Will I stop going? Absolutely not. I will keep going. It's a great time. Um, I have come to find that at our Universal, the best place to be is uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. They really, they really, like. it's like Disneyland. They enjoy their fucking job so much. That's pretty nice. I, I don't know of any problems necessarily with one in Florida either, but it rains so friggin' much yeah. down there. I mean, that it makes a huge difference too. Yeah. So Universal got me this time, guys. I am so sorry. We've been t- trying to record this the past two weeks at least. At least. At least. Yeah. Because uh, June, which is coming up shortly, we have uh, plans for our favorites in the zombie. That's not already been done or will come up later. They're kind of like the the ones that we, you know, that didn't really fit in any other categories and we just wanted to highlight, basically. Yeah. Um, but anyways, this month may have seemed like a, uh, of May seemed like a groovy, groovy time to revisit one of the most infamous and beloved franchises in horror movie history. To you. The Evil Dead. <laughs> Well, yeah. The Evil Dead was a low-budget indie flick that defied all odds to launch the careers of its creative leads and ushered in a new subgenre in the process, the so-called Cabin in the Woods horror film. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because, yes. Uh, it technically could be. I don't know if it'd be its own season, but it could It could almost be. That's so funny. I was thinking about that today. I'm thinking that it could be. I mean, I don't know that we will do that because Cabin in the Woods falls under – not only just zombies, and I say zombies separate from monsters because they are. I know they are a monster, but zombies is its own separate category. Um, and then you would have any, like, monsters or creatures, uh, any kind of lore, um, slashers, um, human horror. There's so much that could happen in cat. There's so many different movies I could think of with different types of Cabin in the Wood theme, you know? I just realized I think the monsters that actually get picked in the Cabin in the Woods uh, horror comedy movie are actually redneck zombies, basically. Oh, God. Of course. I mean, they're slashers, but, I mean, that's kind of what they are. But we'll see. We might cover them this this year. I don't know, or this season. Yeah. Uh, Anyways. Uh, While not intended to become a franchise, the movie did go on to spawn two more direct sequels, a TV series, and an in-universe remake with its own spinoffs. Uh, the film uh, even went on to inspire other up-and-coming filmmakers, such as Eli Roth, to get into the business and create their own horror films. God bless. Also, Cabin in the Woods scenarios. Yes. yes. Uh, so grab that double-barreled Remington, uh, which is not really a Remington, but we'll get to that. Make sure that there's plenty of gasoline for the chainsaw and join us <laughs> as we cover The Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn, and Army of Darkness. Uh, but first, if you're enjoying the podcast, we would appreciate if you would take the time to like, comment, subscribe on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Uh, it helps us get more visibility on podcast listings and helps us grow. Also, consider following us on social media. You can find us on TikTok and Twitter under Death Holler Pod, and we can be found on Instagram and Facebook under Death Holler Podcast. We appreciate everyone who listens and hope you enjoy the show. You know, I'm seeing the listeners. We, I see the. I'm paying attention to the analytics. I promise, I'm not turning into a podcaster we know that we love and appreciate, but gets a little angry. <laughs> <laughs> That I don't know. Okay, I don't want to go there. But anyways, um, we I see the listens, and we're seeing. I'm seeing some more likes. So 
all I'm asking, I'm not asking you to pay or subscribe or any, well, subscribe definitely, but not, I don't have any kind of thing where you have to pay us. But, dude, leave some comments because we're at like 3,000 plus listeners. We might even be higher now for our most recent one, which was Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. And I just want to know what y'all think. We got quite a few likes on that one. And I'm just like, dang, so they liked it. We got a lot of listens. Our hours jumped through the roof on YouTube specifically. Um, Leave some comments, good or bad, man. We've gotten some really great people that went into some in-depth comments on our past few episodes we put out. And, man, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Even if you think it's negative, you know, there's things we can do to turn that around. There's things we can within our will. We'll try, you know. As long as it doesn't involve a bunch of money, because yeah, can't necessarily do much. This with podcast it right is faux free. That's why we you don't pay to listen. <laughs> which I don't know if some of y'all would, but you know, if you did, hey, we love you. <laughs> but for the listener who brought up that Tallahassee is not the <laughs> ultimate zombie killer, and uh, Daryl Dixon is, we'll give Daryl Dixon his due. We we will cover The Walking Dead at some point this season. Absolutely. Uh, well, even if we have to give up something we were going to do otherwise, we will cover that. Yeah. You kind of have to. I mean, you know. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Movie discussion. The Evil Dead, 1981, the OG. Uh, tagline, they got up on the wrong side of the grave. I fucking love that. <laughs> Zombie season has by far had the best taglines. It really has. Uh, directed by Sam Raimi, written by Sam Raimi, uh, music by Joseph Loduca, uh, budget for 350000 U.S. dollars, which was way higher than I Fuck. or thought it was. I would not still, have thought that. Yeah, that was a low budget back then? That was low budget even back then. I mean, they were, you're talking most movies... <sighs> Average range, fifteen million or something like Jesus. that. I mean, uh, but box office it made two point four million in the okay. U.S. and and between two point seven and twenty and twenty nine point four. Hey, there's some debate there. A uh, million dollars worldwide, so it made a lot of money Fuck worldwide. Yeah. And that's not even counting the physical media sales because. I am pretty sure that I own more copies of Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness between DVDs, Blu-rays, 4Ks, than any other movies I own, and I'm not the only horror fan that's that way. Yeah. I got a dumb question. Is this Sam Raimi's uh, directorial debut or even writing debut? It was. It was. He made a precursor short film called uh, Within the Woods, I believe is the name of it, that was basically Evil Dead, but without, like, being thought out, you know, all the way. And that was the only thing he did prior to this. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Yeah, it's, I mean, I I mean, it's skipping ahead a little bit, but you would not, I mean, you, you can tell that it's a smaller movie, but I mean, the skill that he came right out of the gate with everybody, basically, this is a hell of an independent movie, just a hell of one. I mean, even the lighting in the woods, but we'll get to that. You My know. mental score of this film just went up. Just knowing <laughs> that this was his directorial debut. Uh, principal players, we have Bruce Campbell. Uh, never heard of him. Never heard of him, uh, yeah. Playing Ashley Ash J. Williams, uh, our hero in quotation marks. Yeah, quotation marks, marks perfect. <laughs> uh, especially in the first film. Uh, and I'm just going to throw out, because he's going to be covered multiple times, just things that I know of him in, otherwise that I really like him in. Come on, if folks, if you have not watched The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr., watch it. Find it somewhere on streaming. It's probably on Tubi. Watch it. It is a joy to watch. If you like westerns, weird westerns in particular, it's got like a steampunk, like otherworldly, you know, and he's like a bounty hunter in that. Oh, hell yeah. And it's and it's even got uh, uh, the original Gomez, Adams. Oh, uh, shit. As, as like a crazy scientist in it, which is really good. I mean. Uh, the original and, actor that passed away that Angelica Houston was like, I will no longer act without him. It, no, not oh, him. Okay, I'm talking the original, about OG, original. like okay. the original, like uh, not Sean Aston, but his dad. Okay. You know, John Aston, I believe is his name. Okay. Uh, but and then and then uh, another actor who sadly passed away, uh, Julius, and I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. Who played Lord Bowler? He is amazing in that show. Okay. Um, but I it, it it's a travesty that nobody watched it. But 
they didn't really advertise it and it was on one of those channels where not a lot of people you know got it anyways and yeah westerns westerns are hard sell for people i mean they are um they are definitely for me like the most westerny thing i've ever watched is probably wild wild west with will smith and uh it's got a it's got a very much a vibe like that and fallout It's it's very much got a vibe like okay. actually both of them. There is a in the very first episode they introduce like this sphere that when you what like it fuck? grants people like superhuman powers when the, and it's from outer space. Oh my god! I bet you Noah loved that. I I know he's seen it. I mean I don't I've never heard of it, but I know Noah have seen has seen it just because well he loves Bruce Campbell. So there's that. Um, we have to mention though Ash versus the Evil Dead. Yeah, I mean, of course, and I actually, I, I want to go back and rewatch some of that here in a little bit. I mean, I, I'm um, with you on that one. <laughs> uh, it's it's interesting though because when they came out with that show, they didn't have the rights to Army of Darkness because Universal was not willing to play ball with them that well, Bitches. so they could reference things around it, but they couldn't directly reference it itself. So whenever they if, if that's the thing to this point of me is like, well, how, why are they not mentioning anything about him being in the past? But they couldn't, you know, they hint at it that it happened, but they can't mention it. You know, you and I both appreciate Universal Studios. When we go and we visit, you get to go to the one in Orlando, I, I in um, California or Hollywood, as they call it. But they I, really be pissing movies. me off. Yeah, I love their movies. They piss me off with their movie rights and their music rights. They yeah, are the, they're pretty hardcore with both. They're the ones that we have the most trouble with on our podcast, which, <laughs> granted, we're not supposed to be doing some of the shit we do on our podcast. I've been pushing the limits. Well, it's not my fault. YouTube allows it, you know? And we're not monetized, so it doesn't matter. But there's That's some true. things. If they claim monetization, it's like little jokes <laughs> on you. We don't get paid for this. Yeah, bitches. But um, we are so free. But that even being said, there's sometimes where it's still we're not being monetized and we might even only be using, you know, 30 to 45 seconds or whatever. I get it. It's longer than what I I don't even know what the allowable if there is an allowable there used to be. And they'll just flat out say, nope, you can't play this in America. And it's like, well, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's a shame, too, because I really do. I mean, when I sit down and think of studios it's between them and old Fox studios that are probably the two that I enjoyed the most movies for. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, is there any, uh, Bruce Campbell things besides Briscoe County that you want to mention at this time? We'll just do one each. If there's one that we know of, you know, for no. the person. other than Ash versus the evil dad. That's the only, that's the only other thing I believe I've seen him in. Oh, you've seen another one that we'll be covering around Thanksgiving. Uh, in particular, Black Friday. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll discuss that then. Yeah. Uh, Ellen Sandweiss plays uh, Cheryl Williams, which is Ash's sister. Uh, she is actually the first Deadite that we see on screen Hell ever. Yeah. Uh, she was also in Evil Dead, the 2013 remake. She does Cheryl's voice in that. Uh, came back into the cameo. That's fucking badass. Uh, Richard uh, Demanicor, a.k.a. Hal Delrick, uh, and I'll get to reason why that's why he's got a different name and as, long as, as well as another actor in the movie, uh, in the trivia. Uh, he plays Scott. He is Shelly's boyfriend, and he was in Evil Dead the Game, which a lot of them came back and did voices for that, which is kind of cool. I forgot about the game. The game was badass. Yeah, the game was legit done well. And they've had multiple versions, too, because I had one for the original Xbox as I was looking through it where you have a little sidekick named Sam, I believe it is, which is hilarious because, you know, but it's but the voice by Ted Ramey uh, instead. He's like a little, you know, short midget looking guy that like runs around the Nash. Like he's a deadite too. So Ash like actually throws him and like kicks him into other deadites and does damage to him or something in that game. It's really weird. Yeah. Um, Betsy Baker plays the OG Linda. And I say that because they every movie has a different a Linda. Linda yeah. It. I was wondering about that. Cause obviously, well, we're going to discuss part two, but I didn't check to see if it was the same one or not. All I know is white woman, blonde hair, you know, yeah, they all look alike. <laughs> all you white folk, you know? 
uh, Ash's girlfriend in all incarnations. Uh, she was in Oz the Great and Powerful, also made by uh, Sam Raimi, and she played a quad- quadling woman in that. Uh, actually, I think Ellen Sandweiss and Teresa Tilly, both uh, other actresses in the movie, are also in uh, Sam Raimi's uh, Oz the Great and Powerful. Um, which is not a bad follow-up to The Wizard of Oz, but yeah. it's not Return to Oz, which yeah. we love in our hearts as being the thing that scared us the most as kids and traumatized us. What the fuck is a quaddling woman? I don't remember, to be honest, from that movie. I, it's been a while, and I know that um, James Franco is like Oz in that, and he's caught a lot of shit since the Me Too movement, so I don't, they probably have buried this movie, because I think Disney put it out, so they're kind of like, no, we didn't do that, you know? Yeah. Uh, And rounding out the cast, Teresa Tilly, a.k.a. Sarah York, uh, in the credits, uh, plays Shelly, who is Scott's girlfriend, and she also came back and did a voice for Evil Dead the Game, in addition to being in Sam Raimi's uh, Oz the Great and Powerful. So, synopsis. Five college friends makes a trip out to the boonies of Tennessee to spend the weekend in a cabin. As it usually goes, the hills of Appalachia are filled with evil spirits, and one by one, the friends become possessed corpses that delight in the torture and death of the living. Will Ash step up and save the day or become one of the evil dead himself? Ash is barely holding on, Linda is completely (laughs) gone, and Cheryl learns that some trees don't stop at hugging. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the ultimate experience in grueling terror. I just realized something. It could have saved them so much trouble. Because when they got to the cabin, would you agree that immediately they started hearing things? Uh, they, they, There was a spooky vibe right from the get-go before they even set foot in the cabin because that one uh, uh, porch swing was like slamming against the house for no real reason. You okay. know? There was a weird thing going on there. But did they see it? Uh, no, I- they didn't. Did they hear it? They did hear it, yeah. Well, that's the problem. If they had just like, nope, I didn't hear it, that's the problem. They didn't follow the basic rules. If you seen it, no, you didn't. If you heard it, no, you didn't. This could have saved them so much trouble, they would have survived, don't you think? Uh, that and not playing uh, Professor Noby's cassette that is, player. That is true. That That's the other part of it. But they could have also denied that they heard that, too. Well, that's true. It's like I didn't hear that, I, and I don't, and I don't know what this thing is that's screaming as it runs through the forest at high speeds Mm-mm. at me. So, no, definitely not. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, lessons were learned. <laughs> uh, and it actually was filmed in Tennessee. I, I mean, you can actually tell. Like, I mean, I'm going to throw this out there. Justified. I love the show, and it's set in Eastern Kentucky, particularly areas that I'm very well acquainted with. And they filmed it in California. And when they go into the forest and there's like pine trees that are sky high and there's no like undergrowth beneath the trees, I'm like, that is not fucking Kentucky. You're not, you're not here. If you have to, if you had to cut your way through the forest because there's so much undergrowth, then you're in Kentucky or Tennessee because shit just grows crazy around here. But uh, no, if it's like perfect, you know, forest floor with, you know, just like dead leaves, you're in California or some other fucking place because it ain't here, you know. You got so much brush and everything, but, like, do y'all have crazy wildfires like we do? They control burn, like, all the time. Good. That's actually, what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it was, like, actually just a few months back they had they had a control burn all around here, and it was, like, smoky as fuck. And it, but they, they get rid of it, so, I mean, yeah. they do their job. So, yeah, you mean, like, what Trump said and everyone fucking <laughs> went fucking crazy over that shit? You mean they're actually doing that? Uh, yeah, they actually do it. Yeah, uh, it works. Unfortunately, it is not enough to keep the ticks at bay. Oh. Um, I am a Lyme survivor, so I am well aware of their fucking Fucking shit, man. Blech. Okay. <laughs> They're in my yard now. I'm not happy about how that. How do you how do you control that? Can you control that? Can you spray for them? Well, you can have them sprayed for. You can keep your lawn like super well trimmed, which is why I was out yes. mowing today to cut them out. Uh, but yeah, I, it's and it's because fucking wildlife packs them yeah. in, and they're all and wildlife is all around us here. Oh, so. you should take them to the vet and get one of those little <laughs> fleeing tick collars. You know? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that to a deer or a turkey that walks in my backyard. Do it. <laughs> Don't be scared. Isn't your wife white? Just like white women, you know, they just fucking get these wild animals, you know, and just. Oh, yeah. They just sing to them and they come to the. Yeah. She's a fucking Disney princess. I just know it. But yeah, 
all that to say, when I watch this movie, I can definitely tell it's Tennessee because it looks it looks right. That's you know, funny. the woods the woods look right, you know. Um, other taglines in this movie, uh, scream as your nightmares come true. Okay, I like that. I don't hate it, but it's not as good as the original. Uh, this one was just added later. The producers recommend that no one under 17 be allowed to see the evil day. <laughs> not 17-year-olds back then, but not a good tagline. Uh, and also, can they be stopped? That's kind of cool. That is, and the answer is kind of, ish. but not really. They can be stopped-ish. They can yeah. be paused. They are, it, let, let's just put it this way. If I had a choice between 28 Days Later Zombies, uh, Walking Dead Zombies, a.k.a. Romero Zombies, uh, Evil Dead Zombies, or let's just say the new Dawn of the Dead Zombies, I would definitely say Evil Dead Zombies, get the fuck out of here. Like, I'll, I mean, I'll probably die against running zombies, don't get me wrong, but I will at least try to survive versus these things that you have to hack them to pieces and then they can still come back or, you know, or burn the book maybe. And that gets rid of them. You know, there's there, you have to do a lot of damage to a fucking evil dead or a dead eye to get yeah. rid of it. I mean, but just think of how much fun you would have. They have jokes for fucking days, dude. Oh, like they, you they would do. laugh yourself to death. They, they are pretty funny, especially whenever they're doing three stooges routines. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, quotes, uh, the voice on the recorder. And I'm just, there, there's a few quotes here. We'll, we'll pepper in some more as we go along. Um, I know that now that my wife has become a host of the Kandarian demon, I fear that the only way to stop those possessed by the spirits of the book is through the act of bodily dismemberment. Sounds like fun. Uh, and I had to add this in here because originally Professor Noby called it nat Naturum de Montum, but then it's retcon to Necronomicon Ex Mortis, mm. which, you know, which is Book of the Dead, Book of the Dead. I mean, it don't make any sense, but it sounds cool. Well, what does Naturum de Montum mean? I, I, I think, like, I don't really, I'm not really running it through. I would think uh, of, of natural death That's or something like that. That's what I was like thinking, that. yeah. Uh, just throwing it out there if I was, you know, going through it. But Necronomicon makes more sense, and it also ties in the Cthulhu mythos with H.P. Lovecraft, so I'm cool with it. And remember, we proved this last season because of uh, Jason 9, you know. Uh, Jason Voorhees is a dead height. Straight up. Yeah. So they, they exist in the same universe, technically. Uh, and then, of course, the voice of the evil force, join us. That's, uh, that's, yes. Yeah, that's pretty big in the first movie. Uh, and then uh, the the second movie has a lot better quotes, but... We'll get there. Yeah. All right, visually. I've kind of already hinted at this, but there are scenes... I mean, first of all, we got to mention the, the Raimi cam. Like, he did shit with the camera that is yeah. still being mimicked today. Yeah, I mean, it was sick, man. And just the way that, like, he speeds through the forest with, I mean, and what he did was is they would put the camera on, like, a two-by-four, like, strap it to it, like, maybe a couple of them, and they would just, like, on each side just grab it and run through the forest. While oh, yeah. They were, like, it's, I mean, it's simple, but it looks so cool on film. I think it looks amazing, and it's not only, I don't know how they manage it. Okay, I can see putting it on a two-by-four, but how did you make it look smooth? Because you're running, so you're running on rough terrain still, you know? Which is probably good there in California, because could you imagine running through fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee, yeah. <laughs> hills and hills and hills. Uh, that's a good point. I don't know. They they did it somehow. Yeah, um, I mean, because it doesn't have to look smooth. It's just a fucking force coming at you. But I would say that even slowed down, it was it didn't look like, you know, Blair Witch is what I'm getting at. Oh, no, it wasn't the shaky cam that mm -mm. makes me want to vomit whenever I'm watching the screen. No, um, I think they did an amazing job with that. Uh, which, tangent, there there was a time in the 90s where everybody did the shaky cam action scenes in movies. I'm so glad that that has went away because <laughs> I couldn't keep up with the action. I felt like I was going to vomit. Like, what the fuck were you guys doing? Like, choreograph your scenes or get the fuck out of here, you know? <laughs> Anyways... <laughs> There, there was none of that with the Sam Raimi cam. And we've already covered Sam Raimi doing, like, weird shit with, like, camera angles and stuff 
last season and slasher season because Intruder is a movie that he helped make with yeah. uh, Scott Spiegel and uh, even uh, well in Evil Dead Two. You know, the redneck guy in that was actually the bad guy in Intruder. You know, oh, he was funny. the store manager. But um, what the, the hell Campbell's happened to Bobby Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Bobby Joe. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, Sam Raimi's like, he even does weird camera shots when he's not running through the forest. Like the zoom ins that he does, like on the, the like dead eye, especially Cheryl when she's under the, the floor and like raising up the, you know, the trap door. Like he keeps the camera moving at a pretty regular pace so that it's not, you don't get the Kevin Smith effect. Yeah. You know, where you have a static camera that just sits on two people while they talk. You might get a little bit of that, but then all of a sudden, Raimi is like doing this whip around shot where something's coming in from the side and it's always kind of like kinetic, basically. Yeah. Which is, which is really cool. I mean, it's, it's really not done that often. And that's just camera effects. That's just, that's just filming. Not, we're not even talking about how cool it was back in the 80s, all the fucking gore in this movie. <laughs> Which they they do, like, I love the fact, I mean, I know why they did it. It's in the trivia. They tried to avoid, like, an X rating with all the blood by mm-hmm. making it, like, different colors, like black, yes. green, you know, white, especially with that milk color, which is grosser Blech. than blood, to be honest. Yeah, the cottage cheese. Blech. And I just watched Aliens, like the, the James Cameron 4K, which looks amazing, but a lot of people have issues with it because he removed the grain, but that's neither here nor there. We'll get to that whenever we cover that movie. But Bishop, when he died, whenever he gets ripped apart at the end of the movie and he's got like he's a cyborg and all that like milk-like substance is running out of him because it's like his whatever fluid is keeping him, you know, the robot part of him around. Uh, reminded me a lot of the Evil Dead, just the way that they, you know, because that's what they spit up, you know, just weird colors. Yeah. Um, and then the effects at the end, like the stop motion stuff, it's yeah. hokey, but it's nostalgic hokey. Like, it is. I, I, I kind of dig it. I think it worked. Um, I thought that I was going to be put off by it. Um, I'm here to say that I wasn't, so... It's actually kind of gross in one scene it because is. it looks like cottage cheese. <laughs> That's or what something. I said. The cottage cheese at the arm. It's like, why? You didn't even need that. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hungry anymore. Yeah, you definitely won't be after watching that movie. No, um, definitely not. And they and they actually had, uh, I believe, K and B. They actually had the guys who would go on to like do, I mean, makeup effects for The Walking Dead for. A lot bigger budget stuff. They started on these movies. It, if they weren't on the first one, they were definitely on the second one. But I mean, they uh, so they they had a good crew of like smaller independent like special effects people working on this. Uh, yeah, and I would say very quality uh group of special effects because what they had to accomplish like with the trees and with the, oh, it's yeah. one thing with the bodies up close, but the tree. You know, the infamous tree scene that if you, unless you've been hiding under a rock in the woods um, and never had a tree go up your butthole uh, or any hole. <laughs> it goes in every orifice. Every orifice. Uh, then you don't know what we're talking about. But, and if you don't, what are you doing here? Because that, uh, that has to go down in history as one of the uh, very unique to have thought about that. Um, I thought it fucking worked. I was like, what the hell is this lady getting fucking banged by a tree? Yeah, tree grape. It's um, not well uh, looked back on by modern audiences. And even like, uh, I believe it's in the trivia, but I think Sam Raimi even kind of felt bad that he went through with it at the time. I don't feel bad. But (laughs) I think that it, I think it sold the evil of what the Mm -hmm. creatures were, that they would do that to somebody, you know? Yeah, if there's one thing we know about the evil evil dead is that no one is fucking safe and they will not fucking stop. They'll do fucking anything. It's evil. It's not considerate. It's not called the considerate dead, okay? (laughs) (laughs) There is probably, there, there is a movie uh, that came out on Shudder, and it's from Hong Kong, I believe, or not Hong Kong, uh, maybe it's Korean, uh, called The Sadness. Um, I don't know that I'm going to make you watch that this season, <laughs> but it, it it ups the ante on, like, the, the grape possibilities Jesus. because they're, like, demonic uh, 
zombies, basically, kind of like they are in this, but a little bit different. And um, let's just say that eye holes are involved. Jesus. And we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's, talk about skull fucking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesus. <laughs> but uh, moving on from that. I, if you watch this movie, they the lights that they have, along with the mist that they make in the forest, yeah. the, whatever, however, because I can't remember exactly. I don't. I, they didn't have a lot of money for fog machines, so a lot of the scenes were literally somebody smoking off camera and blowing it into the camera. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> but um, the the way that they lit up the woods with like little just spotlights here and there to kind of just like bring up the the light, you know, level on the ground so you could see more. It's really well done for an independent movie because most of them are either dark as fuck or they've got that day for night shot or whatever where it was filmed during the daytime, but then they turned down the colors and post-processing to make it look like it was nighttime and it looks like shit. Uh, you can really tell they filmed at night in this movie. Like, they straight up filmed at night. I mean, it's... Good on uh, them. And, I still think it looked good. I still... It still brought a decent amount of fear when you were looking out into the darkness of the woods, you know? As it should, because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's part. Of, I mean, there's an innate fear of being in the woods at night, and there should be. If you've got any sense in in you whatsoever, you should not want to be out in the woods at night. Even if you don't believe in the supernatural, there is human beings are not built for night time, mm -hmm. like walking and all that. We were built to maintain a fire somewhere and hope to God that something doesn't come running in from the darkness and try to take us out. Yeah. <laughs> which is, I mean, which is what they do in the movie. They sit around a camp or the fire in the fireplace and the evil comes in from the darkness and takes them out one by one, you yeah. know, which could be, I mean, it's tapping into a, uh, latent, you know, uh, ancestral fear. I mean, which is one of the best ways to get people scared. Uh, speaking of that, this is probably of the original. Uh, it's definitely of the original trilogy. The, the only one that treats the horror is like straight up. Like there's, there's no break really in the, in the, I mean, there's no comedy to relieve anything. Um, they move to a horror comedy mold in the second one. And then they just keep doing that from then on out. But this one and, and some, and it divides the audience a lot. Some people, fall on the, the camp that they think the first one, because it is a straight horror movie, uh, even at the end of it, I mean, Ash technically dies at the end of the movie if you don't, like, follow on with the sequels. Uh, uh yeah. Did he die, or did he just become one of them? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, I mean, either way, he's, he, he's gone. Yes. But, but, I mean, there there but there is a definite camp of, like, people who prefer the first movie to all of the sequels, even, I mean, part two in particular, uh, whether or not they, just because of the horror division of it. I mean, uh, and, I mean, the story is basically the same as part two, so there's, I mean, and I kind of went over it. I mean, you know, they, a bunch of people, friends go to a cabin, they play the tape. Uh, it's fairly basic now, but it's actually, uh, it's a effective story. I mean, having the, the tape play out like, you know, the, the incantations and you get kind of that demonic vibe. Yeah. On. Well, and the thing, it's very, this is the original. I can't think of anything else that they would have picked this up from. Uh, so to me, this is what I would consider like an original storyline, which I fucking love. Obviously, this is one of the first Cabin in the Wood movies we get. There might be something else, maybe of a different type of cabin horror. I can't think of anything, but also I don't watch a ton of movies like you and the hubby do. Um, I can't, outside of slashers, but I think this even had, like, Friday the 13th beat as far as, like, the Cabin in the Woods scenario. Um, Would you say that, Um, oh, God, what's the Hillbilly Cab, uh, not Cabin movie, but Hillbillies in the Woods, um, Deliverance. Deliverance? Was that in the 70s? It was, but it wasn't, I mean, it was basically, they were out in the woods getting It molested. wasn't really a cabin in the woods, huh? Yeah, it okay. wasn't really you were holed up in a cabin and getting attacked. Okay. So yeah, um I think everything about this is original, which just that's why this one is a classic. Uh I mean, clearly from the get-go, it made a good earning. 
uh, got a return and what it fucking created. And from what I had read, Sam Raimi had a hard time funding this project. I know you'll get into that, so we won't discuss it quite yet. But it's a lot of problems with the funding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But even then, and so that's just how well it did immediately after it was released in theaters. That's not including the cult following it has now. <laughs> It, if you don't like this series, or at least like don't like the remake, you, there's a lot of people that will straight up throw you out of the horror fandom for not <laughs> liking it, something involved with this. I mean, it does have its you know camps, part one versus part two, and then the Ash trilogy and the series versus the the new ones. There is divisions the within it, but if you don't like at least one of the you know versions, uh, you get the fuck out for a lot of horror fans. <laughs> Oh, my God. No, I love this storyline. I mean, it's so fucking scary. Now, if we did not know about the evil dad and you found – it's hard because you, we know about it, but we found cassette tapes or an 8-track or a record in the cabin, you know, would you be curious to hear what was on it? That's the other thing. Humans are always going to play the thing. They're always going to read the book. I mean, that goes into even like Lovecraft uh, mythology. Like there's these books that are forbidden knowledge and, and they'll even have people telling the protagonist in a, in a, you know, in a Lovecraft story, don't read this. You'll go insane. You'll see yeah. things that no man was meant to see. And the person will be like, well, I have to read it now. No. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like a reverse psychology. Um, I feel like, Noah would be like, oh, my God, look at this. We have to hear this. And then I'd hear three bars, and I'd be like, it's done. I'm going home. Either you stop playing that or I'm going home. Like, Because yeah. why would you want to hear the rest of that? It's not anything interesting. It sounds scary as fuck. If I had – if he – before – if it's me – I would have heard the first part of that and hear him speaking about how he found this book, ancient text, all that. And then before he started the incantations, I'd be like, nope, shut that the fuck off right now. Like, I'd been done with it. I know that given the current Evil Dead, which we reviewed, which I will be re-releasing after these episodes so that people can hear what we thought about Evil Dead Rise. But going to that real quick, jumping into the future... I know for a fact if my daughter had found the Necronomicon or a record the same way that kid did, the way he found it, I know for a fact she would open it and play with that. <laughs> I know she would. <laughs> While her brother in the back would be like, I don't think you should do that. I don't think this is a good idea. Like, shut up, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> uh, I even here, Here's like a weird like tangential story, and like I feel like it kind of relates to this. I was in uh, Joseph Beth Booksellers, like in uh, in Lexington, one time years ago, and I found this book that was like laid up on a shelf, had no dust cover on it, and it was just and what it was was like a, a graphic novel novelization, basically of a bunch of Joe R. Lansdale's horror stories. I thought it was pretty cool, but it didn't have a cover, so I was going to try to you know weed them down and say, listen, you know, you got this on there, it's missing some stuff, whatever. I took it up to the counter, and they're like, this isn't even in our system. If oh you hell want that, no! They're just take it with you, and I did. And for <gasps> years, I've been like, you dumb that- motherfucker. <laughs> For years, I've been like, did I pick up a cursed book? You know, like, what the fuck? I just want to let you know that in a pinch, it's not like the, it's not necessarily the most human thing to do, but you could absolutely hand that to a baby and they would take it willingly. (laughs) They wouldn't even know. How are they going to know? How would they know? Yeah. (laughs) So, and if I get a book for my birthday, I'm not accepting. (laughs) Yeah, I'll send it through the mail to you. <laughs> like, uh, um, no, thank you. But it's, but I'm just all that to say, they're, humans are curious enough. This, the, the, it's insidious how well this plot works. I mean, for someone to pick it up, and even in the new one, they don't have anybody reading it off. I don't think it's the guys legit like reading through the actual Necronomicon itself. I think is how, I mean, he might be having a little bit of it played for him, but he's reading out of the book directly because he's curious about the book. So can you read the Necronomicon and just not say anything out loud? Um, you probably could, but nobody, no protagonist in the series has ever been able to do that. Yeah. Cause they're, cause they're always like, Hey, Hey, look at this. What are these words? And then they start rattling off whatever it says. Yeah. I mean, 
Latin. I tell you what, man. I think this is why, because Latinas, we, we have it in our name. I think that's why we're so evil. <laughs> I think, well, not even we're not so evil. I think that's why we're considered so evil. It's just in the name, you know? You hear Latin, oh, my God, Latina. Yeah, they're evil. You ever think about how weird it is that all evil uh, presence, uh, in, at least in post-Christianity, uh, is always confined to, like, Latin phrases and everything? Yeah, it's, what the fuck is up it, with that bullshit? Yeah, like, nobody, like, Celtic phrases occasionally come up in folk horror, and then you get, like, the green man or something weird out in the woods that pops up when you utter Celtic phrases, but it's generally Latin they will fuck you up if you start reading it, you know? Yeah, I... I'm not, I'm like it's like I had an epiphany. I'm just like realizing this, and I don't know why because it is. And then you have to use Latin against them to stop it. Who the fuck speaks Latin? I don't even it's speak like, Mexican. It's like that phrase on The Simpsons from Homer, and I'm I'm paraphrasing, but it's like beer is the cause of and the solution to all of the problems. Yeah, I <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself. And it's Latin. It's it's the cause of and the solution to all of the horror movie problems. It's like how you have to get like you have to get the the medicine from the source. You have to create a cure from the source. <laughs> so fucking dumb. Let's move on to acting. Uh, but yeah, the story is original. Just to sum up, and uh, to to my knowledge, I, and that's why it's it works so well. It's 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 good. But anyways, acting. They're competent actors in this movie, despite the fact yeah. that they're, they're not. I mean, there, there's a little bit of jankiness at first between, like, you know, Scott and Ash and all that. Yeah. I mean, but, like, as the movie starts mounting as it goes along, I mean, for fresh actors who've not really done anything, they mm-hmm. do a decent job. Is this um is this Bruce Campbell's first acting? <laughs> yeah, but I'll get to I'll okay. get to he. He was embarrassed of his own acting ability all the way up through part of or the beginning of part two, and then he's okay with it. I was about to say because I feel like he's been the same character his entire life. He he might be, but like he 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 can accept it past his crying in part two. Okay, like at the beginning of part two when he cries, and then he kind of laughs about it afterward in the movie. He he said then he can watch the movie, but he can't watch part one and he can't watch part two up to that point just because he can't stand seeing himself. Okay, and that's fine. I can respect that. At least admit that you were able to grow as an actor, maybe, and that you had to start somewhere. I thought that all of the actors, I think there's two things that happened in this in this film. I think that the writing was good enough and the actors were able to bring to life what was written because the writing was just kooky enough that even if the actor was janky, it was supposed to look that way. And they don't like it. it, To me, it's almost got like a realism vibe to it in the first movie. Uh, Even as far as like how it's filmed. I mean, not the camera swooping camera angles, but like the lighting as they're like driving into the town and they see the two rednecks that are off the side of the road and they wave at them. The lighting looks like Eastern can, Kentucky, you know, Eastern Tennessee. It's yeah. kind of grayish, kind of overcast. Yeah. It's not like, you know, super lit up, you know, like and sunny, like you would imagine in a lot of Hollywood films, which I guess, you know, fits for the area. But uh, them being kind of like passive and, and then like not really knowing how to respond to like what they're seeing makes sense for the movie. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. It's just... This movie, when I first when I first saw this movie, I was like, "What the fuck am I watching?" Um, uh, it, it almost seems like a snuff film, <clears throat> kind of. Uh, and the actresses were just at first to me annoying, but then when you think about what they're doing and how they're supposed to break you down, what better way to break someone down than to have this evil, condescending way about you? This laugh, this, you know. It's 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 too much, and I love it because it just fucking it works for what they're trying to do. So I think everybody did a great job, you know. The only the only one who's kind of weird, and 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 the only reason I bring this up is because my wife mentioned it, and like you know, as a casual observer of it, Linda when she becomes a dead eye, she's a little too like Harlequin, like you know. <laughs> well, that's you know, what I—that's that the one I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking. How yeah. annoying it is, but how much would that break you 
fucking in in that situation. She's oh, there yeah. to destroy you. And if she has to start it off by annoying you and also being scary, that's just going to get me real fast. I hate yeah. to admit it. I, Cheryl scares me more in this being under the floor and yeah. all that. But, <laughs> but I, I, I agree. There's a point where Linda kind of flips and she's more, you know, it, it's like you could tell she's breaking ash, like with the way that she's, you know. To me, uh, Cheryl is scarier than Henrietta, even though Henrietta's in part two. And I know we'll get to that, but. Well, that's because Henrietta's kind of played for laughs. But. Well, yeah. I mean, at first, she kind of looks just like a standard zombie-ish, you know? And then it turns g- into the monkey neck thing. Yeah, yeah, and actually physically sounds like a monkey, which is not bad. The word <laughs> jumping ahead. But yeah, Cheryl is scarier because she is just a this dead... Uh, uh, you know, like miserable creature under the floor, basically. And I yeah. mean, and, and, and there's something about that too, that taps into fears, you know, like we're, we, we fear like basements and like what oh, yeah. can be down in them. And like, there's something about her rising up out of the, you know, that floor repeatedly, you know, and, and if you get anywhere near her, she can attack you and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I can see some people maybe thinking the acting's not as strong as it could be later. You can definitely tell, you know, Bruce in particular improves as he goes yeah. along. But it's not bad. It's, That's it, it how fits it's the supposed movie. to be. This is the first for everyone on this set. The fact that they were able to be this successful with this first movie that was, let's let's just call it what it is. It's a launch pad for what it ended up being. They didn't know it at the time. You never know that stuff until after it happens, and then you're like, okay, here we fucking go, you know? And, and, and let's just compare it in degrees. If we compare it to, like, a lot of independent movies, the shot on video ones that a lot of people, myself included, can't really stand because of how lousy the acting is, it's not in day difference between this movie and those. It, oh, you, yeah. It's literally, you have, like, people in a room in those, those shot on video ones where they're standing there. It's like, what are we going to do now, Bobby? And then somebody, it's like, I don't know, Jim. What will we do? You know, it's so flat. It's so yeah. like direct and just, you know, they're spitting the words out that they were like, you get some of emo- I mean, you get a good amount of emotion from everybody in this movie. So they do a good job right out the gate. Yeah. I really think that this movie could have been so much worse because the actresses, your wife is 100% correct. Fucking annoying. But I think that because of how it's written, I think how they continue it, I think I think that the writing is what helped make it not be too much or oh, what's the word I want to use Too, it's annoying, but not like to the point where it doesn't make sense, you know, or detract or pull you out of the movie. Basically. Exactly. Yes. And pull you, there you go pull, to pull you out of the movie. It did not do that. So I think that both of those worked so well together. And then, of course, the music, I mean, oh it's God. understated, but it, it works. No, the I music mean, is perfection. Because this is one of the first movies where I've noticed the movie in a way, or excuse me, noticed the music in a way that it's there, but it's not annoying. It works so well, especially with the, you know, the wind in the background or the crickets or whatever, because sometimes it just gets super, super quiet and you don't even have cricket noises or you don't have the ticking of the clock or anything like that. But sometimes that music, it almost reminded me a little bit of Resident Evil, the game. Well, duh, Resident Evil is a game first. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Like when you're like, as you're just walking through like Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, mansion or the. Yes. you know, the you have the sounds of the footsteps or you have the sound of the wind creaking of the house. But then sometimes you have a tap of a piano key or just something to kind of let you know shit's about to go down if you're not careful, you know. And you also have that, um, which I've got it in the trivia, that whooshing sound as the like the dead eyes are like, you know, running through the forest oh, like, yes. toward people. That was actually Sam Raimi was like in the in the hotel or whatever they were staying at bef- right before they went there. He was like laying there one night. It might have even been like smoking through the window or something like that. And he heard like the wind like gushing through it and he just got out something and recorded it. And he's like, that'd be fucking killer in the movie. And that's what they use for the dead eyes. There you go. <laughs> Again, another example of how the smallest budgets can give you some of the best results. In fact, a uh, perfect example to prove the point. Um, I think that Dr. Strange, uh, 
uh, whatever it is. It, uh, they call it Dr. Strange mom on like neurotic just because that's the initials of it, but it's, uh, something of, of madness, uh, multiverse of madness. That's what it is, which Raimi came in at the last second to direct. And it's got his touch and it's got like his camera angles and all that. And certain one scene in particular, which is probably the best scene in the movie. Um, it's fucking, it's awful in a lot of ways. And it's very excessive in its budget and everything. And it shows you that Sam Raimi does better whenever he's got, you know, like a little bit of financial constraint to kind of force his creativity. The creativity that is involved when you have such a small budget is so important in every film that we review, not even just zombie season, in every season we've had so far. It it makes you, uh, even sometimes... I mean, if, if a perfect example will we'll come up to it eventually in this season because it's my favorite Romero movie, period, Day of the Dead. Romero, the, the what he had in mind for the movie and what he got uh, financially approved for were night and day differences, and he couldn't make the movie that he wanted. And he had to really severely like, limit like the scope of the film, but it made the movie so claustrophobic and so like just dour that it made the movie better because of it. Oh my God. And it, and it, and it took him decades to admit that, but he finally admitted it. And he said that it actually was the, his best film that he made period. So, you know, financial constraints, they sometimes force you to do, uh, even if they force you to go back and make the, you know, the script tighter, that that's an improvement, you know? Yep. Uh, anything else you want to say about this one before we go into trivia? Uh, Trying to think. No, let's go through trivia because there might be things that I might want to discuss in there. There is. And then the other thing is, too, is like this movie and part two are they're so close in kind of their layout that uh-huh. like I feel like we'll get more if we just kind of move on to part two. I think as so, too. Discussing it. Uh, Sam Raimi originally wanted the title of this film, The Book of the Dead, but producer Irvin Shapiro changed the title to The Evil Dead for fear that Book of the Dead made the film sound boring and that kids would be turned off by it being a literary reference. Like, ooh, it's a book for nerds, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't agree with that. I, I mean, we know it is The Evil Dead, and that's, it is what it is. It's, it's silk. There's nothing that I, we could do. I think it's a better branding. Because Book of the Dead could be construed as like, I don't know, maybe like an Egyptian type thing. Oh, because that's yeah. What, you know, so. Okay, that makes sense to me. Because I'm thinking, no, nah, Book of the Dead sounds fucking scary. But that's because we know what the Book of the Dead is. Yeah. Now, but, what do you think if they had named it the Necronomicon, though? I don't. It See, if you get too fancy with your title, you get a lot of people you got to keep it simple for the simple folk because evil dead, you know, people are like, I'll watch a movie with a bunch of evil dead fuckers, but you put the name, the title, the Necronomicon, if they can't pronounce the Necro, I don't know what the fuck that is. And I'm not going to go watch it. Cause that sounds like some high pollutant shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. Fancy pants, rich McGee over here. <laughs> and they're literally saying, fuck you to the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so dumb. I mean, I'm just playing the the, the devil's advocate on it. Yeah. I, mean, I think Necronomicon's good, but I, again, that, that is also because to, we know what it is, though. But but it also ties back to Lovecraft, and I'm pretty sure that there's been horror movies since named the Necronomicon, which goes back to the Evil Dead. It's like it's a whole brand unto yeah, itself now. That is true. It, it actually is. I mean, I do agree that Book of the Dead sounds better, but at the same time, the Evil Dead was genius in the fact that they could copyright that and now it's theirs and nobody else can have it yeah uh urban spiro was also the man responsible for the distribution of not the living dead and other famous horror films uh upon first viewing this film he joked that while it wasn't gone with the wind it had commercial potential and he expressed an interest in distributing it so well, he was right good choices were made uh, Andy Granger, a friend of Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, gave them this advice. Fellas, no matter what you do, keep the blood running down the screen. Uh, they included the scene in the finished film where the blood literally runs down the projector screen uh, as a tribute to him for saying that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the original script called for all the characters to be smoking marijuana when they first listened to the <gasps> tape. The, the actors tried this for real, and then the entire scene had to be scrapped and reshot because they were all 
very uncontrollable in how they reacted once they were high. Oh, my God. That's funny. Because it was probably, I wonder if it was their first time or not, you know? I doubt it, considering the time period. This was early 80s, late 70s. Yeah, but they'd still. Probably, they, they'd probably partook, you oh know. Oh, my God. After completing principal photography in the winter of 79-80, most of the actors left the production. However, there was still much of the film to be completed, and most of the second half of the film features Bruce Campbell in various stand-ins, or as uh, they like to call it, fake shimps, to replace the actors who left. So if you look at the end roll, uh, credit roll of the movie, there's like a bunch of fake shimps that are, you know, going back to the... Uh, uh, Three Stooges reference oh, uh, at the end of the film to account for the people who had to basically be like, you know, the, have their backs turned or yeah. makeup covered, you know, versions of the, the <laughs> actors that, who were no longer there. Interesting. Uh, the film's first cut ran at about 117 minutes, which Bruce Campbell called an impressive achievement in light of the fact that they only had a 65 minute length of screenplay. <laughs> to film uh it was then edited down to a more marketable 85 minutes okay the the original version was conceived as a horror drama with the occasional um joke to bring some levity and would focus on the terror that made it to the final product but also the tragedy of ash slow losing his friends and his guilt for not being able to save them after watching the first cut ramey campbell and tappert uh, agreed that the film was already grim enough and they trimmed it down to just be a straight horror film they was like yeah focusing on ash like losing his mind and everything else is a little much considering everything else going on yeah i think <laughs> Which it I worked agree. though uh, at the end of a normal day of shooting, Bruce Campbell would return home in the back of a pickup truck because he was covered in fake blood from head to toe. Oh, gross. I didn't even think about that because I thought that I had read. Well, maybe he didn't stay, but I guess most of the crew stayed in the cabin, which, by the way, I saw a video of that cabin being built. I thought it was pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool that what they did with that. Yeah. Uh, the blood was a combination of Cairo syrup, non-dairy creamer, lots of red food coloring, and one drop of blue food coloring to darken it. At one point, Bruce Campbell's shirt that he wears in the film was so saturated with the fake blood that after drying it by the fire, the shirt became solidified and broke. Oh, my it God. It broke in two <laughs> when he tried to put it on. That's hella funny. Uh, one of the most intricate moments during the editing was the stop motion sickness uh, sequence where the corpse is melted, which took hours to cut properly. Ew. Uh, in an interview, Betsy Baker said that when she learned that the producers were interested in having her star in a horror movie, she was so suspicious she would only meet them in a public restaurant to agree to, for the for the initial meeting. I wonder why. I don't, I don't blame her. It's like some guys, you know, messages like. We want you in a horror movie. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? Do no. you like scary movies? Do you like scary movies? Uh, director Sam Raimi and star Bruce Campbell were friends from high school where they made many Super 8 films together. Oh, hell yeah. They would often collaborate with Sam's brother, Ted. Uh, Campbell became the actor of the group as he was the one the girls wanted to look at. So funny. Uh, according to Sam. And then the Campbell uh, has played brief parts and cameos in most of Raimi's films ever since. Hell yeah. Uh, that's one of the few good things about Doctor Strange, uh, uh, whatever, Multiverse of Madness. At the end, there is a scene in the movie where when they go to one of the multiverses, Doctor Strange does, Bruce Campbell's like a hot dog vendor, and he's basically another version of Ash, which he's kind of always played anyways. Uh, and it's just funny because he loses his hand in the movie, which is a good reference. Yeah. You know? Oh, my God. Uh, the eerie wind noise in the movie, as I said before, was recorded by Sam Raimi. He first heard it through his bedroom window while he was trying to sleep and thought it would be perfect for the movie. That's, and it yeah, was. it was. It's creepy sounding. It's, it's a very weird and off-putting. Uh, the opening sequence of the evil moving over the pond was achieved by having Bruce Campbell push Sam Raimi in a dinghy while he filmed the shot. Oh, my God. Uh, filmed in a real-life abandoned cabin, the property's owner granted the production crew uh, to lease the cabin under the condition that any modifications made for filming were to be undone. The crew kept their promise, and the only thing that remained in the cabin was the fireplace that was specifically built for the film. Okay, that's weird because I really saw a video of this cabin being built from the ground up. That's so probably part two. I'm wondering if that was part... Yeah, I'm thinking maybe it was another part. They, they, but... they did rebuild. They, they built it in... Uh, I'll get to it in a sec, but they built that, I believe, in... In South Carolina. Okay. And uh they they and they just had a blank property that they could build on and they just built the whole cabin on. That there. makes sense. Okay. 
the cabin was located in the forest outside of the small town of Morristown, Tennessee. Uh, Bruce Campbell said in his biography that it was later burned down. To this day, the exact circumstances are unknown. Sam Raimi claimed that he burned it down himself after filming because he believed that the cabin was haunted. <laughs> However, according to other sources, it burned down years after the film was made because teenagers, being how they are, oh, illegally went to the cabin and accidentally set it on fire while camping outside of it. Today, the only remaining part of the structure is that fireplace that they specifically built for the film. Hell yeah. And, and additionally, no one will give out complete directions to the cabin's location as too many people have already vandalized the property after finding out it was used for the film. Fucking assholes, dude. <laughs> At the end of principal shooting in Tennessee, the crew put together a little time capsule package and buried it inside the fireplace as a memento for the production to whoever found it. And that was actually dug up by Kentucky filmmaker Dane Sears, who is currently known for the Hopewell haunting in 2023. He showcases it, uh, the remains of the time capsule, on a YouTube video uploaded to his Quick Hill Films channel. So there you That's go. That's badass. So did, did anybody, prior to him finding it, did he know that it existed or did he just find it on a whim? I don't know the exact details of that. I think it was out there, the rumors, if you were a horror fan, and I and I think that he was the first person to actually find it. It's like it's like finding the fucking Titanic and just, you know, one of the bottles of wine that's down there, you know? Or holding onto a locket that's worth millions, living oh a life God. of poverty, and then throwing the locket in the water at the end of the movie. <laughs> it's been 87 years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the cabin used as the film set was also the lodging for the 13 crew members with several people sleeping in the same room. Uh, living conditions were terrible and the crew frequently argued the cabin didn't have plumbing. So they spent days without showering. Ew. They fell ill frequently because it was freezing outside. And by the end of production, they were burning furniture to stay warm. That's hella funny. And that wasn't the only problems they had. The temperatures were so cold during the shooting that the camera and other wiring froze. They then <gasps> had to be thawed by the fireplace inside the cabin. What the fuck? Oh, my God. Uh, one reason Sam Raimi moved the production to Tennessee was to avoid the harsh winter shooting conditions in his home state of Michigan. In an ironic twist, the year that they filmed The Evil Dead ended up being one of the mildest uh, winters in Michigan's history and one of the most brutal, uh, brutally cold in Tennessee's. It's because he, they, it, it, the earth knew he was doing evil shit and they brought evil upon him. Uh, you could argue that. Uh, several actors had inadvertently been stabbed or thrown into objects during production. What the fuck? Uh, Betsy Baker lost her eyelashes in the process of removing her facial mold. Ew. Bruce Campbell received numerous injuries during the making of the film. A noticeable one caught on the film is the scene where the possessed Cheryl's hand burst through the cabin floor to seize Ash by the face. A trickle of his own blood, actual blood, is running down his head uh, because he was gashed in the head by the puppeteer in the floor who blindly grabbed for Campbell. Oh, my God. He twisted his ankle on a root while running down a steep hill, and Ramey and Rob Tappert, because they're friends, and this is what guys do to friends, quote-unquote, decided to tease him by poking his injury with sticks, thus causing Campbell to have an obvious limp in some scenes. Fucking assholes. <laughs> a cameraman slipped during filming, smashing his camera into Bruce Campbell's face and knocking out several of his teeth. Oh, my God. Uh, suffer for your craft. Yep. And I have to say, I've not had the best experience meeting Bruce Campbell in person, but man went through some shit in this movie to give us the, what we, we now love. So Wait, is he an asshole? He's, it depends on when you see him, but he's kind of jaded. What do you and mean jaded? It, and it, it's, it's a bad look. What do you it's, mean jaded? It, 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 it just, he, he, it's like he's over ash but like nobody oh. will let him be over it so oh, he's, i can it, understand that but come on man it, this is what made you who you are and it, you know, I, it's it is what it is i mean uh while scouting on location bruce campbell's brother don uh took a nasty fall off of a cliff he was treated for injuries at the hospital in morristown tennessee and released the same day the bill was 15 dollars. wow can wouldn't that you be nice to have yeah. a hospital bill only be 15 bucks oh my god i pay for it out of pocket don't even bill my insurance i've got this uh, the white contact lenses were painful to wear, very painful. They covered half the eye and had to be taken out every 15 minutes just to allow the eyes to breathe. Ooh, yeah, because back in the day, it was like glass glass. 
Yeah, the nothing got through. Uh, according to the cast and crew, this was one of the worst experiences they ever ha- had filming due to the freezing temperatures, the locale, and Raimi's filming, which took endless hours to do. Uh, when there wasn't any filming, Bruce Campbell would actually help out the crew in preparing shots and props around the set, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, in Germany, the movie's February 1984 release was hindered by public authorities for approximately eight years. Uh, originally, 1982 cinema and video releases of the movie had been seized, making the movie a hit on the black video yeah. market circuit uh, with pirated copies of, uh, around uh, abounding. A heavily edited version of the first made uh, uh, first movie was made available in 1992. Uh, several high-profile horror enthusiasts, among them author Stephen King, publicly criticized the German ban on the movie. In other German language markets, uh, the movie was never restricted from distribution. And the first legal uncut version of the movie finally went into public circulation in Germany in 2001. Jesus it fuck. It took them over 20 years to see the movie uncut. Damn it. Uh, this version was seized by German authorities less than a year later, however, and it was not until July 2016 that they uh, officially made it legal again. Like, y'all remember y'all had Nazis, right? <laughs> well, that's kind of why they're so about, you know, showing violence in Germany. I guess they're afraid the Germans are like Dobermans. If they see blood, they'll go for blood. So they're like, we can't have that. I don't know. It's kind of how they are. Quit treating them like caged animals. (laughs) That's where you're going to go wrong. And that's actually what led to World War II, but we'll leave that history aside. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, the film was shown to Stephen King, and it was his glowing endorsement, which was later used in the film's ads and posters, which really sold it to the public. The film was brought, bought by New Line soon after he endorsed it. We have our disagreements with Stephen King, but could you imagine if he endorsed the podcast? He would never, but... He, he would never, but... Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Stephen King, I loved his old books. I mean, even up to, like, I don't know, his accident whenever he was actually hit. He, he was... He, he's a damn good writer. Lots of his movies. I love them. His pol- politics, mm-hmm. after years of drug use and whatever else happened to him up there in Maine, the man is a, is as bad as Mark Hamill. And we've already discussed yeah. how bad Mark Hamill is. So he's awful in person, but he has boosted the horror careers of a lot of up-and-comers. So kudos for that, yeah. I guess. Uh, there's a ripped poster in the basement. And I noticed this specifically watching this of the Hills have eyes from 1977. Hell yeah. Now re- the reason that they think this is in there is because there was a ripped poster for jaws that appeared in the Hills have eyes that Wes Craven put in there because he wanted to show that the Hills have eyes is way scarier than jaws. So Sam Raimi and the other ones suggested, well, our movie is more scare is a lot scarier than Hills have eyes. So we're going to put that movie poster in our film, you know, and, and say it's even scarier, which I mean, it's neither of them were lying, but you were also (laughs) talking about kind of different genres, you know, like the Hills have eyes is scarier than jaws in a, different in a human horror kind of way where jaws belongs and when bad animals go bad you know and they're they're both scary in different ways yes totally valid and then again the evil dead is scarier in its own way because it's supernatural horror it all it's it's all different it's all different which uh, side tangent though um so in our Universal Studios, in my world, um, their studio tour turned 60 years old this year. I don't know if you had heard about that or not. So they returned their studio tour buses back to the original ones from the 1960s. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so it looked really cool. But also, I guess back in the day, um, in well, I, I shouldn't have said 1960s, but 60 years ago. So that, well, I guess that was the 1960s. So my dad's 64 years old. Or excuse me, my dad was born in 64 and he's 60. Um, but I think they had some things from the 80s. And one of the things back in the 80s, you used to take a picture with the shark that looked, you know, in the movie Jaws where they thought that they had gotten the shark. Yeah, but it was the, yeah, not was the a, one that it, it wasn't Bruce. It was the it was the other shark. Exactly. Well, uh, they that you were able to get off of the tour bus and actually take pictures with that shark. Um, so in Florida, 
they still have that shark hanging up for you to take pictures out on the pier yes. next to where the uh, the actual Jaws ride used to be at. Ooh, there was a Jaws ride? Yeah, it was out on the water, and it would, like, you know, circle around the lagoon and come back in. You That's hella badass. Well, we do have that. It's part of the tour where it attacks you and shit, and a tank blows up. It's actually really cool. Uh, really hot, though, if you're sitting close. Because that fire really is right there in your fucking face. I don't know how they fucking manage to do that, but they do it every time. And um, and so, yes, the shark's there, but you were not able to get off of the um, bus to go take a picture with it. They actually moved the shark away from the pier, and you could get off and go take a picture with it, which I actually have a video of people doing that. It's really cool. Um, I was like, oh, man. I, I, but my kids were being buttholes this particular trip. Their dad wasn't there to tame them. So they're like, we don't want to get off. It's like, what? Feed you that shark. The best shark. part about that shark is, is it's built large enough to where you can actually, as an adult, stand inside yes. of its mouth. Yes, I it is it. huge, though. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, Joel Cohen of the Cohen Brothers fame of course. Uh, was an assistant editor on this film. Wow. Uh, this was one of his earliest professional jobs. Then his brother, him and his brother Ethan, would uh, produce and make the film uh, Blood Simple three years after the release of this film. Uh, and in preparation to get funding for that movie, uh, the Coens enlisted the help of friends Bruce and Sam uh, to help out, and they happily did so. Campbell and Ramey also starred in a short film based on the scenes from Blood Simple so that the Coens could show the basically the the what the film was going to be like to potential investors and they actually thought it was pretty good, so that's why they got the money for it. So if it wasn't for Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, we wouldn't have the Coen brothers and all the films they've given Aww. us. So there you go. Fargo and No Country for Old Men and all that good stuff. Hell yeah. Uh, most of the demon point of views that glide through the ground were shot by mounting the camera to a two-by-four while Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell ran along either side holding it. Fuck Yeah. Uh, the cabin did not uh, did not actually have a cellar. Most of the cellar scenes were filmed in the stone cellar of a farmhouse owned by producer Rob Tappert's family in Marshall, Michigan. Uh, the last room of the cellar was actually Sam Raimi's garage, which is where the tore up sign or poster was for the Hills of Eyes. Uh, the hanging gourds and bones were a tribute to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And for the scene where the students descend in the cellar, a hole was cut in the floor, a shallow pit was dug, and a ladder was placed into the pit. So they literally cut a hole into the cabin floor, dug some of the dirt out from underneath that, and then they they claw, crawled down into it to make God it look like they were damn. going down. That's insane. Uh, on the first day of shooting during a scene shot on the bridge, the crew got lost in the woods. Oh, my God. It's never a good sign. Uh, when Cheryl returns to the cabin right after the scene with the vines <laughs> where she complains about wanting to go home, Scott goes to say something and then suddenly stops, throws his head back, and steps out of the shot. This was due to the fact that uh, the actor, Richard DeManicor, blew his line and they kind of cut it out of the film. That's hella funny. <laughs> Uh, over his years uh, as a director, Ramey's 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88, originally bought by Ramey's father for the family when Sam was 14, has played Ash's car in the Evil Dead movies. It was Uncle Ben and Aunt Mary's uh, car oh, in Spider-Man. It was Annie's car in The Gift in 2000, which is actually a pretty good movie, too. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Ganache's car in Drag Me to Hell, which is... I, it's got its detractors. I think it's pretty decent, and it, it is in the Evil Dead universe uh, and has made cameos in nearly all of his other movies. It's actually in a very pivotal scene in Doctor Strange uh, Multiverse of Madness. It's like he goes to this alt dimension where, like, the evil version of Doctor Strange destroyed everything and sitting there in a very dead-eyed-looking, you know, location in the forest is the car. So it's kind of a neat... Uh, another neat nod to his movies. Uh, at the premiere screenings of The Evil Dead, blood donor stations were giving away free tickets to the movie along with pin badges say, stating, I bled for The Evil Dead. To Hell blood yeah. Donors. <gasps> Could you imagine having one of those to this day? It'd be worth so much money. So much money. Much money. Uh, Rob Tappert joked in an interview that it was uh, their way of giving blood back to the community after so much fake blood was used to film me. That's actually that's actually pretty badass. That's pretty cool. Uh, inspired by William Castle, Sam Raimi had ambulances on standby as publicity stunt at the film's premiere. Oh, my God. Uh, on the tape in which the demon resurrection passages are read aloud, some of the words spoken, which appear to be Latin, sound like Sam and Rob 
Das ist Hikers dann die Rotze, which means Sam and Rob are the hikers on the road, as it was actually Sam Raimi and Rob Tapper who played the two rednecks that waved as the car passed. What the fuck? Uh, dead chickens were stabbed <gasps> to replicate the sounds of mutilated flesh, and Bruce Campbell had to scream into a microphone for several hours. Uh, as part you of the sound. Flash. Oh, dead chickens. Okay, I was like, yeah, what the not fuck? not live chickens, but dead chickens. <laughs> uh, the white liquid that often, em- often emits from the possessed after they're injured or maimed is 2% milk that Sam Ra- Ra- Raimi chose to use, not just to show how possessed aren't normal beings, but also to mix it up for the MPAA so that he wouldn't get an X rating. But ultimately, they had released the film unrated anyways because the MPAA sucks donkey dick, as we've said multiple times. Yeah. They had uh, to after, use some cottage cheese, too. Yeah. Well, they's getting their dairy in for that. Ugh. I mean, you know, they had to. Uh, after Scott says, don't you see, Ash, they're alive, he screams higher than his normal voice register. This was actually Sam Raimi's voice meshed in the Scott's scream. Uh, Sam Raimi shot a short film called Within the Woods to act as the calling card for this future debut. Uh, it did the trick. He was able to raise $90,000 necessary to start the film. Wow. But... The film ran out of money, and only half of it was completed in the winter of 1980. In order to complete it, Sam Raimi, Rob Tappert, and Bruce Campbell did everything they could to complete the film, from taking out high-interest bank loans, borrowing money from friends and family, and even cold calls to businesses around their home state of Michigan. Uh, The cold calls worked in that they were actually got catering, gasoline, and other necessities that the cast and crew needed to, to complete the filming. And Bruce Campbell went on to put his family's property up in northern Michigan as collateral so that Raimi could not only finish the film, but also blow it up to 35 millimeters, which was required for a theatrical release. Raimi was so grateful for Campbell's financial contribution that he credited him as co-producer, and at, he's been co-producer since then. Yeah, at minimum. Damn, that's what, that is so scary. You just don't know. You know what's funny about that? Uh, winter of 1980. The Reverend Doctor was baking in the oven during that time, getting ready for his world debut in that following June. Oh, just that is true. <laughs> yes, we were. Yes, we were. <laughs> so was La Arena. Uh, production would frequently be halted when local hunters wandered into the location randomly. <laughs> what, what y'all doing out here? <laughs> oh, we're just filming a movie. Yeah, what, what, what are you doing? Oh, we're just hunting some deer. Uh, Richard DeManicor and Teresa Tilly, members of the Screen Actors Guild, had to use stage names to avoid being penalized for participating in non-union production. DeManicor credited himself as Hal Delrick and then, or Derick, whatever, and Tilly used the name Sarah York. See, that's why I think the Screen Actors Guild is kind of a sham. Yeah. Because you, you can't like, I mean, they wanted to do the movie, but they couldn't because if they did, then they were like, it's a non-union job, you're being scabbed. So they had to like come up with totally different names on the production. Yeah, that's it's just, some, it's it's silly. It, it doesn't make any fucking sense. Sounds like a f- not fun cult. It's basically what it is, yeah. and it's not really those concessions that they got after this recent, you know, big uh, strike they did. They've already admitted that it's going to cost half of the people in the Screen Actors Guild their job going forward because it, it it's only going to, I mean, really help the people who were getting booked for stuff already. So, yeah, I mean is what it is uh during scenes involving the unseen force in the woods watching the characters sam raimi had to run through the woods with a makeshift rig jumping over logs and stones this often proved difficult due to the mist and the swamp around there oh yeah uh shots of the moon had to be matted into the night scenes in the footage a square outline is visible around the moon mat and his glowing review of the film stephen king specifically cited the matted moon footage as being part of the film's low budget charm, charm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I I actually do dig it whenever they have like this super big ass fucking moon that's clearly a matte painting in a lot of these horror movies because there's something nostalgic about yeah. seeing it that way. I need to I need to look closer at that because I haven't. No- I mean, I don't notice these things. I would. I have to. I have to watch it again now. <laughs> Uh, Ted Raimi was used as a substitute in many scenes when the original actor was either busy or preoccupied, a.k.a. he was a fake shimp. Yeah. And, he be- and he became a real shimp in the form of Henrietta in the next movie. Uh, when Ash shoots a dead eye through the window of the cabin causing an explosion of blood, Bruce Campbell is actually firing real-life ammunition at a dummy, causing the scene to look more realistic. Yeah, why not? Why the fuck not? 
they were out in the middle of the woods. Yeah. You get to shoot a gun. That's what the fun is of being out there. Uh, in a scene where Ash drives away from the cabin, he gets out of the car and uh, seems to walk at an angle, creating an eerie and otherworldly effect. This was accomplished by parking the car on a slight incline and tilting the camera at, at the same angle so that the car appeared straight. When Bruce gets out of the car, he is walking on flat ground, which looks crooked because the car and the camera are both sideways. Ew, weird. It's a neat effect. Yeah. Here's where I was talking about with the cigarette smoke. They actually stood in for dust caught in the sunlight when Scott first opens the cabin door. According to the director, Sam Raimi, producer Rob Tapper just stood off camera smoking and then blew smoke into the shot. Oh so it looked like dust. Hell a ghetto, but if it worked, it worked. I hate, it looks legit in the movie. Uh, Lucy Lawless, of all people, Xena, Warrior Princess, saw this film and she was actually in later the Evil Dead TV show with with Bruce Campbell. Uh, when she saw this upon its release, she was appalled, particularly by the infamous vine grape scene, and wondered what kind of horrible person would make such a film. Ironically, she would later marry the same asshole that that insisted upon that grape scene in the in the film's producer Rob Tappert, uh, and he was actually the one who said it needed to be worse than everybody else was making it. So. <laughs> It's funny. She's like, who would make this movie so terribly? And then she saw Rob Tapper. She's like, you know what? I love this man. And I love this. Like, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I wonder if they had vines around their bed and, you know, their home. Uh, they, they, maybe they, they've gone into that stuff since then. Who knows? Uh, but she's actually went on to work in, because of her association with Rob, uh, and many productions directed or produced by Sam Raimi. Uh, she was in Xena, Warrior Princess, which Raimi had a hand in. A uh, small cameo, cameo in Spider-Man 2002, and she was Ruby in Ash vs. the Evil Dead in 2015. Um, God, 2015? It's been that long. Since Holy that been shit, out. that's almost 10 years old. Time goes quick when you're old. Aye. Just saying. We've just aged ourselves. Uh, was this was one of the first films to be labeled as a video nasty in the UK and was banned because of it. Video nasty, that fucking word is so uh, funny. Uh, the biggest selling VHS release of its year in the UK. It's funny. The UK is like, we can't have this. We're going to ban it. And uh, people in the UK are like, all right, we'll buy the fuck out of this. <laughs> it's like banned books in America, man. Banned books and banned movies too, actually. <laughs> uh, the affordable single barrel shotgun was purchased by Bruce Campbell at a Kmart for its specific use in this film. Since the budget was extremely low and there, where they were filming was secluded, they actually just used live ammunition. Hell yeah. Uh, scenes where Ash shoots the window and also a dummy filled uh, with blood was shot. Most of these scenes were filmed at low angles so the camera would not be hit. <laughs> well, that's good. For other scenes, Bruce Campbell simply mime fires the shotgun. At the end of production, star Bruce Campbell and, and Rob Tabbert brought along 100 shells and shot up every prop that they used in the cabin. The resulting rubble was then lit into a huge barn fire uh, by director Sam Raimi. Oh, my God. Notice they were able to do that and not actually kill anyone on set. Strange how that works, huh? Listen. <laughs> We've said it before. We've said it a million times. Alec Baldwin's trigger finger don't miss. Mm -hmm. They just don't miss. Uh, Bruce Bruce's brother Don is the current owner of that shotgun. Hell by yeah. the way, the characters of Scotty is named after Raimi's longtime friend Scott Spiegel, and the character Cheryl is named after Cheryl Gutridge, the star of Raimi's short film Clockwork from 1978. So I guess he did have another short film that came out before that, but this is like his big yeah. directorial debut. Uh, the hectic location shooting in Tennessee often called for night scenes to be shot during daylight hours. So the windows of the cabin, that's when they were the inside, by the way. Yeah. So they had to cover up the windows to make it appear night outside. And at least one shot from the finale had the opposite situation. They filmed during the evening with a bright light outside to make it look like it was dawn. <laughs> Where I, that's, that's like one of the first few times I know of like night for day or whatever. Yeah. It's like, it's like, well, you know, this thing, we're going to have Bruce walk out. It's going to be dawn outside. He's finally made it out of the cabin, but it's not outside, and we don't have time to, to really wait on this, so let's just put a big light outside and make it look like the I, sun's coming I up. I guess, but why not just wait for it to be dead? I don't understand that, but okay. 
when you're when you're on a shoe butt, you know, shoestring budget, you got to do what you got to do. We're literally uh, talking what, hours. It's not like you had to pay him for those hours. Fucking go to bed, wake up, it's dawn. <laughs> They'll be dead by dawn, okay? That is true. Uh, when Ash reaches for the necklace on the floor, and this is not the first time this happens, yes. it actually happens again, the chain forms the shape of a skull. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the comic series Marvel Zombies, it is revealed that Ash somehow ends up in a parallel Marvel universe and ends up being the cause of that universe's uh, zombies. So Ooh. there you go. That's kind of cool. Uh, I, I actually read that. It's pretty good. I mean, Ash is, you know... I don't, and the thing is, is like Bruce Campbell, this is another reason why it's weird with him. I get why he does it. So, image, or it wasn't image, it was Dynamite Comics had Ash Comics, basically. They took his likeness and they, they made like basically Evil Dead, but he didn't get paid for any of that. So, if you ever took one of those comics up to him at a show and had him like sign it, he would rip it in half because of the fact that he didn't get paid for those comics. Which is kind of a douchebag move, just saying. So I wonder if Marvel actually paid him for his likeness, considering I think that that was a crossover with Dynamite, and Dynamite wasn't paying Bruce Campbell for his likeness in the comics. Uh, I hope they did, because of how iconic he is. Uh, Ellen Sandweiss uh, said the tree scene would be filmed in a different way today as it was done then. Yes, I'm sure that the tree scene would be done differently if it was filmed today. First, I'm not so sure it would be characterized as tree grape. As uh, Sam Raimi has said uh, since then that he regrets that it ended up that way, I think it would have gone back to what was originally intentioned in the script, the trees coming to life and attacking Cheryl, which would also satisfy, satisfy today's more feminist audiences and actresses. And I'm sure that CGI would be used instead of reverse filming or whatever it's called to show vines wrapping around me, San Weiss said. Uh, producer Robert Tapper said that the infamous tree grape scene was inspired by a scene in Shakespeare's Macbeth. This, this is a very big stretch for a reason why you want tree grape in a movie in which the Burnham Fort woods come to life. He, he literally quoted Shakespeare's Macbeth and said that the woods where the woods came to life at the end of the movie inspired him to come up with this scene. I know that's some bullshit. I, I think that for the time the tree grape scene, grape scene should have happened. I don't think that it should have been changed, and I don't know why Sam Raimi filled that. Maybe he's saying it because he has to, because in I Hollywood. Think he's, I think he is, but also maybe he, he feels like it's a little too mean-spirited. You know how people, when they get older, they kind yeah. of, you know, mellow out a little bit? But I agree with you 100%. There's, it, it adds so much to how much danger the evil is mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, it takes away something by not being in there. Yeah, and I know and, that any feminist title I had ever potentially had which is very little according to today's standards um i would totally have been ripped from that but i do think that if you were to remake that today you can make it possible you can make it to where there is a scene where a tree does enter a woman per se we'll just say it like that to keep it podcast safe i think that you can make it somewhat consensual to where she's mesmerized in a way i mean how many dracula movies have we seen where she's under some kind of weird ass spell and she's in love with what's happening and then you see this happening now it's not rape anymore you can't call it that you know you you can try to say it's against her will you know but i could totally see them doing that and it would still piss off a woman to this day I have something to a bone to pick with her asser assertion that today's audience is more feminist. Maybe, but I think that 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 Hollywood, if anything, has proven that they have incorrectly assumed how mm -hmm. feminist women and and well, I guess men too, because you know men yeah. can be feminist, uh, really are. Because just for instance, Furiosa has bombed this past weekend. Worst opening of any Memorial yeah, Day I've heard. Uh, film in 30 years. And that's because Anya Taylor-Joy as Furiosa is, puts off vibes as a girl boss. Now, I've heard that she's not in the movie, and they actually, she's not a Mary Sue. They build up how she gets the what she does. Okay. But people are sick to death of girl bosses. They just don't want them in their movies anymore. It's like they don't want a 120-pound nothing, you know, uh, girl or woman 
like going up against 300, you know, 200, 300 pound guys and just kicking their ass like it without. You know, doesn't, you know, yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel natural. Um, I'm saying this as a woman, you know, I don't mind seeing a woman be able to kick a little ass, but she better have been put through the ringer first before she got lucky and was able to defeat a guy or anything of that size or period, you know? And the best heroes do get put through the ringer. Yes. Ash in this movie gets put through the ringer <laughs> before he actually becomes the hero. Like he does. Ash it. is weak in this film. If we're talking, hey. he's not the fucking. He's he's like you put a hero quotation mark. Scott does all of the mm-hmm. action in the movie. Yes, it's, Scott it's is the fucking. Him. Yes, so you look at it, it. It is what it is. Like we're not like oh Ash made it because he's a man. No, no, he got, made it because he got lucky. Yeah, and then in the second movie, he finally becomes the hero that he would go is on to be. forced to become. Yeah, basically. If you want to survive. even Okay, let's go to Evil Dead Rise. We had a surviving woman. Two, technically, a little girl and a woman who, by pure brain and luck, not brute strength, made it out alive and still will continue to have to fight for their lives to, to this point well, on. If you go back to the Evil Dead remake, uh, Maya at the end of that movie, uh, she has gone through hell. She's watched everybody that she knows and loves uh, die at her own hand because she's the Cheryl of that movie. She's the one that's uh, uh, through most of the movie, if I remember right, she's the possessed one that's under the floor, and it's only at the end of the movie that she gets her like mind back and becomes like the Ash-like hero, mm-hmm. and, and she gets pinned by the monster in such a way that she has to cut off her own arm in that movie or hand or whatever yeah. it is, not because it becomes possessed, because she's trapped and she's going to die if she doesn't. Yeah. I mean, she she earns her status. Then. And, and I heard, by the way, she has agreed to come back for a future Evil Dead movie. Hell yeah. The thing about it is, is that you can have a man or a woman be a hero, but for a human, period, doesn't matter who you are, it's not going to come easy. We weren't, especially it, if you were not a <clears throat> trained warrior of some sort. And even then you're going to go through, you know, it's called a battle for a reason. And if you don't, and even if it's a guy and they don't, they don't put in the effort and they don't put in and they don't earn the ending, we don't appreciate Mm-mm, the movie. You don't, you don't. And, and, and that's, and that's the other thing. And so all that to say, I'm, I'm not saying the audiences wouldn't be, you know, like, oh my God. But even back then they were like, oh my God. And it wasn't because they were feminist. It's like, that's a very personal and a very felt attack. It's just like when we covered Alice, sweet Alice, they specifically had a scene where the foot was being attacked because people know what it feels like to have pain mm-hmm. in their feet or their hands. Oh, like God. Fingernails getting ripped off. I can't stand those scenes in horror movies. I have to look away every time when a fingernail is ripped off. Yeah. Because you know what it feels like to cut your finger into the quick. Like, yeah. you know how bad that hurts. And so, like, when they put in grape scenes, even if you're a guy, you can you, you can empathize with how terrible, like, not only in the physical sense, but like how molested they their their mm-hmm. mind has been. Their you know psychology has been fucked up. Look so, at they didn't have it in Evil Dead Rise, but they had it electrical was cords. It was insinuated one hundred percent. And she was like, "Oh, I'm glad it was handled that way, and she didn't actually get attacked." Okay, but in our minds, you did. I hate to say and, it, and it's actually worse because we can imagine way more things. Than what than, than than what you can put on screen. Yeah, that are way way worse. We could still see a majority of your body. You were still making noises, the same that were being made in the woods with the tree. Like, come on now, you know. Like, maybe it was done tastefully, and that's fine. I can respect that. I, that it didn't make me mad that that happened, but majority of the audience, especially that had seen the original, anticipated that there was going to be something similar. So when that happened, we're like, oh, she's going to get raped by the fucking elevator, you know? By electrical cords. Electrical lift, cords, which, yeah. Which are way worse, I mean. Yeah. So, anyways, I, I, I don't like that idea that it's like, well, if it happened today, it's like, 
yeah, I mean, they, they probably would try to, uh, I mean, they obviously did need whatever rides, but they don't, but that's because they didn't have to show it because we already knew what was, I mean, from the previous movie, I think it's important that it was in there just, I mean, in the sense that, that it, it just establishes like the threat level we're dealing with. We're not talking about an evil that just takes over your body, damns your soul to hell and everything else. They will molest you in all ways possible before they ever send yeah. you to that point, meaning that they enjoy yeah. every bit of your suffering. It 100%. Um, and that's way worse, way worse. And I hate to say it, but the quotation mark feminist that would complain about this are the minority. I hate to say it. They are the 1%. They're the vocal minority, though. The yeah, they're the loudest, but it's also a smaller crowd. Don't let the majority start to speak up because you're going to be drowned out. Uh, but getting back to what we said about how Rob Tappert said it was inspired by Shakespeare, that's bullshit. Yeah. He just wanted it to be very sensational, and, and it, it got its point. But here's the funny part. Sam Raimi, to offset that remark about how highfalutin it was, said that he thought it was inspired by the Incredible Hulk. And you know that's a joke because it has nothing to do with Incredible Hulk, but that that shows his type of humor. That's like, <laughs> all right, if you th- if you want to go that route of being so highfalutin, yeah, you know that you think it's like, okay, well, it's inspired by just the fucking comic book character, then whatever. I mean, it wouldn't it wasn't inspired by anything. It was just you know, it's like, hey, how can we ramp this up, you know? <laughs> Uh, originally, the forest just attacked Cheryl, but after seeing the dailies, Rob Tappert insisted that the scene should go further, so they added the penetration shot. I think that uh, they the- did it, like, uh, somewhat appropriately. You see the vine go straight for the panties, and then you see her mouth open and, up wide. And then it cuts. It yeah. cuts away. It, I mean, it, now <clears throat> it, it, it does go in, or go toward, like, inside the line, but it doesn't act, but that's it. We don't see, like, any X-rated shit Mm-mm. from it. No. Uh, the scene where she is brutally graped by the possessed vines is still banned to this day in some countries. I could see that. Uh, you, and you know what that means on the black market? People will are paying extra just to yeah. get that shot in the movie. I swear to God, that's how human beings operate. You it, you can outline, and, and, and I say this as even somebody who's, uh, you know, not necessarily for, you know, uh, certain things myself, but if you outlaw them completely, people will find a way. They they will. I mean, the, you know, the, the black markets exist for a reason. Yeah, and for anyone who might be surprised at that, just keep in mind there's women making six-plus figures selling farts on the fucking internet, okay? so Or bath water. <laughs> yeah, or bath, bath water. water. Oh, my God. Men are pervs, but, man, you do. You make this financial world go round. <laughs> Uh, the logging truck that almost hits the Oldsmobile in the opening of the film was supposed to have had its cable snap, throwing the logs across the road. However, when the crew got to set that day, none of that was set up to, to work. That's so funny. Uh, you know what that means, though? That means that we would have had an innate fear of logging trucks way before way our before. generation saw Final Destination. Yes. <laughs> At the premiere of the film, one of the investors came up to Sam Raimi and said, I'm very upset. I thought you boys said you were making a horror picture, not a comedy. Hell yeah. That's a true <laughs> horror fan right there because, I mean, horror fans love comedy horrors, but, like, if that didn't scare you and you thought it was just pure comedy, you're a horror fan. Listen, I said this last season. As a kid, when I watched Texas Chainsaw, the original movie, I saw the black comedy in the movie. That's how much, I mean, that's probably how fucked up I am. But those scenes where Bubba is dancing around with a chainsaw, if you can't laugh at how absurd that is, then, then I, I mean, the movie's obviously done its effect, I guess. But you also don't inherently see just how fucking ridiculous that old I still don't is. see the fucking comedy in that movie, but that's just me. That's how scared I was, though, so... <laughs> Uh, on the opening night of the film at the Rivoli Theater, Ravioli Theater, Ravioli, <laughs> yeah, the audience yelled at the screen during many of the typically stupid decisions that horror movie characters made. Robert Shea, who is the one that made up New Line, was distributing the film. Told Sam Raimi they would have had to have to make cuts to those scenes. However, when they passed by the Rialto Theater on Forty Second Street later that night, they saw sold out shows for the entire night and heard people praising the film. Shea quickly changed his mind. It was the shortest shortest change of an editing plan that he'd ever seen, according to Raimi. So Robert Shea, who owned New Line, sat in one theater, heard people making comments, said, you're going to have to cut the shit out of this film, went down the street to literally another theater, and was like, nah, I guess people are liking it. Leave it alone. 
fucking movie producing sons of bitches. Like yeah. they, they just need to leave the creators alone in a lot of cases. Uh, the shot of the demonic infection spreading across Linda's leg was shot later with a different actress. She had to keep perfectly still as the infection was drawn into her leg frame by frame, a process that took approximately an hour. According to producer Rob Tafford, once the shot was finished, the standing actress promptly threw up. Why would you throw up from having to sit that still? I don't know if it was that or the way that they were, you know, they, they, they were marking on her probably with a pen or something. So just having that like pressed into, I don't know. I don't understand it. I'm just saying what she did. You oh, know? Okay, Interesting. Yeah. I am very curious to know what would have, I, I'm wondering if like, like if there was any kind of weird back or sciatica pain from being in a position for so long and you're just kind of breathing through it, or maybe you're laying in a way that, you know, one, yes, pen marker, but like when you, I don't know. They say that when your muscle um, is pressed into or something, you can release toxins into the body. That'll make you throw up. Maybe, maybe that's what happened. Interesting. I don't know. I'm just throwing out theories. So, Here's something that I noticed during the, the watching of this film that I hadn't noticed ever before. Uh, those scenes where Cheryl is drawing, you know, and she's in the whatever it is, is taken over and she's writing yeah. out, you know, the stuff. Her hand has that spider web like a possession look to it. That's yeah. writing the the stuff. I had never noticed that before. Okay. I mean uh, I did. I just didn't Yeah, I, I didn't I, I that's weird that you hadn't noticed it before. I just I hadn't paid attention to it. Interesting. Uh in the original script before reaching the cabin, the group were to stop at a gas station where Ash would talk to the owner of the station and retrieve the keys for the cabin. It was also supposed to have an old man playing a banjo, uh, warning the group that some evil force stalks those woods. Down, 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 down. Listen, we all need our crazy Ralphs, yes. but I think this movie's better without one. Yeah. Be uh, Sam Raimi and Rob Tappert called Ellen Sanwise, who plays Ash's sister Cheryl, the queen of Super 8 movies, because she acted in so many of their earlier films. This includes the precursor Within the Woods, uh, which in which Bruce Campbell plays the possessed monster, and she plays the heroine in it. Oh, yeah. Sam Raimi points to George Romero's Night of the Living Dead as an inspiration for this movie, uh, specifically for its use of 16mm film, its small budget, and its smart use of a single location. Yes. So, so technically, the cabin in the woods genre can go all the way back to the Night of the Living Dead, which is uh, farmhouse and farmhouse in the, in the in farmland. The woods, farmland. I don't know, but that that's where it started. Technically, uh, originally the script called for Linda to be stabbed in the foot. However, Rob Tappert insisted the possessed Shelley stab her in the Achilles tendon Hell yeah. to punish the audience more. Yep. I think it works so much better. I mean, think about when um, what's his name was cut in Pet Cemetery. Oh yeah, uh, you're talking about the next door neighbor that Fred Gwynn plays. <laughs> yep. Sometimes dead's better. Mm -hmm. uh, the roaring fire scene in many shots was kept burning using locally bought moonshine. Big shocker. <laughs> Chopped onions rather than eye drops were used to get Betsy Baker to cry. Rob Tappert claimed onions were simply cheaper than Visine. I, yeah. <laughs> well, you're on a budget. I mean, you can't afford the fancy shit. Yeah. When Ash carries Linda outside to bury her, the image of her flowing white robe in a man's arms was a tribute to the look of the Hammer Horror movies. Okay. 25% uh, of the film's U.S. box office came from drive-in theaters. Wow. The ring of keys to the cabin's door once got stuck behind the jam during filming, and that element was added to the film at the end of the tree grape scene to increase tension. Huh. You know, where she's reaching up there trying to get inside, and she can't really get the key. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, they had a problem. They're like, hey, what, let's just throw it in the movie. Uh, the chainsaw was a home light XL12, although the home light logos on both sides and the top were covered with tape, so they didn't oh, yeah. guess, get advertised. Uh, the shotgun used by Ash is a Winchester Model 37A single barrel. It is uh, apparently a 20 gauge, as the shells used in the movie are yellow, in spite of Ash's remark in Army of Darkness that his gun is a 12 gauge double barreled Remington. This type of shotgun has never been used in the series. The one in Evil Dead 2 was a 12 gauge double barreled Stevens, and the one in Army of Darkness was a uh, Steger coach. So there you go. Interesting. Although it is not 
easily visible, Scotty has a stick poking through his abdomen after coming back from the woods. This stick is later pulled out by Ash. <laughs> this yes. is so funny. Resulting in a fountain of blood. Because many people don't notice the stick, it has been suggested that Ash pulls Scotty's penis off. I'm glad you said something because I thought that's what happened. <laughs> Uh, nearly a minute was cut for cinema release and a further minute for video release. That's, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it technically is. I guess, Depending upon yeah. what they cut. Uh, during the scene where Ash is about to cut up his girlfriend with a chainsaw, Bruce Campbell actually had to use a real chainsaw and hold it up to the actress's chest. You can see a close-up of Linda's neck looking at the necklace, and her pulse is racing. Hell Yeah. Uh, during the scene where the possessed Linda attempts to stab Ash with a dagger, Betsy Baker actually had no idea where she where he was. The heavy white contacts prevented her from seeing Bruce, and she was literally battling a uh, he was literally battling a blind actress in that scene. Okay. Uh, the magnifying glass necklace was originally intended to be a plot point. Uh, in the movie, uh, as in it was going to focus the sunlight to burn the Book of the Dead, but it was decided after shooting that this wasn't going to work, so its actual use in the film was a desperate attempt to keep it relevant since so much of the film had spent time on focusing on it, you know? Yeah. So, so that whole scene where Ash is repeatedly, like, throwing it after the book and trying to lasso it, they just added that in. They're like, we got to have some reason why this fucking magnifying lens is in the movie. I wonder if... Uh, contact lenses, colored contact lenses were created specifically for movies. And then, you know, eye doctors were like, hey, we can profit from this by, you know, because they had white ones. And of course, they made them soft, they made them breathable. I I'd have to research. I'm just throwing out a bunch of, I'm spewing shit right now. But like, wouldn't that be interesting if it was actually created for movies? And then, like, eye companies were like, we can make a profit out of this and make them to where these contact lenses you can actually see with them. And change your eye color. So you're saying that you think that the ones that are used for just like commercial or just like recreational use, of, in other words, maybe came from like the use in movies and they're just like, hey, we could profit off of this. Yes, or it could have been vice versa. It could have been like we were created for vision and then movie producers were like, hell yeah, make those in white, bitch, and make them to where our actors can see through them. <laughs> They were probably made for the movies first. I guarantee it. That's what I'm thinking. Because, like, you, you don't think about these cool things for people in daily life. But a movie producer would be like, fuck, it'd be so cool if we could produce this contact lens. You know, this lens that goes on your eyeball that doesn't hurt and makes your eyes look white or evil or cat eye or whatever. And then they're like, I, yeah, fuck, let's put a prescription on those and sell them to normal people. And then cosplayers and, and, and uh, e-thoughts. <clears throat> Uh, are using them to make tons of money now. E thoughts. What are yeah? E E girls or E whatever. Nona was telling my daughter was telling me about them. She's like, they're they're mostly just ho hoes. And I was like, wow. Because <laughs> my daughter can't decide whether she's goth or emo. And I was like, doesn't it have to do with genre of music? And she's like, oh, it it's, just depends. It's also mood, I think. Like, well, emo. That's what, definitely emo because it stands for emotional. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm emo, like cares and they're emotional whereas goth they're like i don't care man whatever the fuck you know like they're they're the opposite way or yeah so. so i guess she is a mixture of both but yeah she uh, she thinks my friend wants an e-girl she's like he probably wants an e-girl <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for many years, Bruce Campbell stated that the final shot in the film where Ash is attacked by a surviving demonic presence was achieved by mounting a camera on a motorcycle and that Sam Raimi drove that motorcycle through the forest and the cabin and deliberately into Campbell. He also claimed to have broken some ribs because <gasps> of this, which was the reason why this shot was filmed last. They were expecting him to be injured. Even though Campbell has repeated this story in his autobiography and during the premiere of Ash vs. Evil Dead, he finally admitted in 2022 that this was all a big joke to add to the myth of the movie and to see how many people would believe it. And okay. many did because he said it. Uh, in reality, Raimi ran through the forest and the cabin while sporting a camera with a wide angle lens mounted on his head. And the crew pulled the doors wide open with ropes as he sprinted through them. Campbell's final shot was the one where he is doused in gore in the basement. Oh, okay. Uh, cream corn was used for zombie guts during the scene where the demons melt. Uh, Ash was intended to die at the end of this movie. 
when the surviving demon attacks him, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell both stated that they made this film to be recognized by studios and to help them get a career in film, not to start a whole franchise. They sold the distribution rights to the film, the new line cinema for an incredibly low price because they felt there was no need to make a sequel. This was later changed when they returned to make Evil Dead 2, which they claimed was possible because they had neglected to sell the rights to the storyline and characters. Uh, it did, however, prevent them from reusing footage from the first film uh, in the sequel's prologue. That's why the, the oh. secondary film re reshot those scenes. You just answered one of my biggest questions. So, okay. But that's going to lead into a theory that fans have that even though it's not true, it's a nice mind meta when it comes to part two. So we'll get into that one and discuss it. Anyways, that's a lot of trivia, but I feel like it's needed because this movie, like, I mean, the, the way that they made this movie is fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I mean... And, and, of course, you're going to have a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes, like, you know... Uh, you know, trivia whenever it comes to this sort of thing, because like they were just, I mean, this is guerrilla filmmaking, like literally the way that they made this craziness that they, that they accomplished what they did. I'm not surprised though, given our experience of low budget films and what we think about them and how we rate them, et cetera. In what way? Whereas where we have always discussed where lower budget films tend, you have to get a lot more creative with them. Oh yeah, I thought you were talking about like the that some of them those very very low budget films tend to be the dog shit. <laughs> well, yeah, of course you're gonna have those, but uh, clearly you're gonna have that with high budget films too, which is I'd rather uh, see a low budget film that's dog shit and understand while well, it's dog shit because they had a low budget. Then well, they had all this money and they fucking couldn't pull anything out of their asses with that. Yeah, cough cough. Um, the recent Marvel movies that came God. out that were for multiple million. $300 million, and they couldn't make a movie worth, I mean, even halfway paying attention to. You know? Yeah, it's it's very painful to watch. <laughs> so, um, I was going to tell you, I mean, this it's another Cabin in the Woods scenario with zombies, but I sent you that, like, trailer for that. Uh, there's a there's a movie that came out where these guys are going to hunt deer in the woods or whatever, and it turns out the deer have been exposed to, like, some toxic radiation or some toxic sludge. And whenever they eat the, the deer meat, they all become, like, basically zombies. Hell, you know? yeah. Um, it's, I, I can't remember the name of it, but I but The most I atrocious like the, thing? The most atrocious thing, yeah. It sounds, and it, lo it looks very low budget, which it was. It was shot during COVID uh, with a bunch of friends that went out to the woods, just like, you know, Sam Raimi and crew did. But it looks like they made, I mean, the gore effects and it look pretty legit. So it looks pretty good. I wonder if this is, hold on, I'm taking a quick gander at it right now. It's on silent, so it's not like anything you're going to hear. But hold on. I want to see if this is anything like, oh, and well. And it's kind of, it's got the horror comedy stuff too. The kind of the goofy comedy that Sam Raimi introduced later on in his movies. Yeah. I don't know. It looks pretty cool to me. I think it might be something to just kind of review for the podcast. Just yeah. kind of, I mean, uh, look it up. But it, it, it reminded me a lot of Evil Dead whenever I saw it, just because it's got that same, like, idea behind it. It's just like, hey, we really want to make a movie, so and we don't have a lot of money. Let's just, you know, limit it to a cabin out in the woods yeah. and just kind of go with it. I think any movie with, like, a one location, uh, low Budget location. We're not talking about like Resident Evil where she's in the fucking mansion, you know? Well, I mean, if you think about <clears throat> Texas Chainsaw Massacre is basically yeah. one location. They had that one shitty house that was next door to the Sawyers, but it all takes place in the Sawyers' house. So, yeah. I mean, that's really where it's at. <laughs> Saw. That <laughs> Sawyer. <laughs> Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. Uh, anything else you want to say about this one? Though? I feel like it's... You, if you talk if you talk too much more about this movie, you basically start getting into part two because they're yes they're very closely tied together, which so. we are about to. Um, I am going to review this movie uh, or give it a rating, anyways. I would like to do that now versus waiting for the okay. two because I now understand how two works. So I will separate. Um, but this one, to me, it's hard for me to get into this movie. I don't know why. I've always struggled getting into this movie now. I have already done my due diligence in admitting that this movie is a, a creative genius was 
involved with this being Sam Raimi. His writing, his directing, I think the actors were able to bring that writing a, a good characterization to that writing. So everything about this movie was damn near perfect. That being said, though, I don't know why I still struggle to get into this film. It's not the low-budget effects because I still think that the, even those look okay. It's definitely not the music. The music was perfect. If it was the music alone, that'd be a five out of five on this horror film, you know, the sounds and everything. So this movie's going to be like a four out of five, but it's like, if it's on, I'll gander at it, but I'm not going to sit and watch it, whereas I feel you and the husband would, it's on, you guys are down and watching. That's that's fair, and I, I would say that's a fair assumption of what how my reaction would be to it. Yeah. Because... I like what they did later a little bit more and my mood does change, you know, based upon like how long it's been, you know, with the film at one point in time, about probably 10 years ago, I would have said that I like this one better maybe than part two, but that's changed in that, that amount of time. I would say this is a 4.2 for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and I, and I, I love watching it. It's just that there's things I like about the second film better yeah and so i it, this one and then like i said others camps it's like if you don't like the goofy comedy then you're not going to i mean but the uh, the lines and some other things are what really sells the same one for me and then also like army of darkness is out there so it has to be factored into it so for me the first movie is a 4.2 it's still good but it's it's not the one that I prefer to go back and rewatch. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. Um, which is uh, funny that you said it's not the one you prefer to rewatch. I still think you would. This is not a rewatch for me. This is just, I, I know what it is. That's why I've given it a four. I've given it a four out of the respect that it deserves. Uh, personally, me, it would be more of a 3.5, but it doesn't deserve that low of a score. Um, despite how how I might feel about it being a rewatch or whatnot, it's just not one of those movies I really get into. So that's just me, but that does not mean that I hate the franchise, and it does not mean you can come at me if you want to. Um, I don't <laughs> mind. I, I totally would understand if you did because I'd be crazy not to think higher of this film, you know? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think of any way that I want to call, uh, would call you out on this, but you're so close to my score that I can't really do yeah, a whole lot. Yeah, we're right that. there with each other. I think they're if both you, very high scores still. If you would, now if you'd said a three point five, I would have called bullshit on that because I mean it. You're, that's putting it down there in the ranks of I don't know. I mean, like I, I know that you rated like um, Idle Hands like way lower than that, like oh, a God. One or something. But I'm just saying, like I mean, gradation wise, like three point five is it's it's okay i mean it's you know and it, it's not it's not a terrible film but it's not like you know but i feel like this one deserves just for what it accomplished deserves mm -hmm. higher than that, exactly so. that and that's what i'm giving it so i think we All should right. move into part two because we it sounds like we still got a lot more to discuss but really you're correct a lot rolls into part two yeah so i mean if that's, I mean, I, I'm assuming for the cut, you're for the way the episodes are going to get cut, this will probably be the end of this episode, but we will continue directly into the second one. So at least on this episode, uh, peace be with you. And with your spirit.